and welcome to Let Them Talk. I'm Paul DiRienzo, and I'm looking forward to a great show tonight. We're live, of course, and you're going to see the phone number up, uh, so we encourage your calls. And I'd like to introduce my guest, Gabriel Don. Welcome, Gabriel, to our show. And Gabriel is a poet. She's a writer. Uh, she's involved in, uh, in, in poetry organizations and writing organizations that uh, promote writing and bring writers together in order to learn how to write better and to, uh, to focus and to, uh, to, I guess we, we use that word a lot in our discussions up till tonight, right? Focus. And, um, and okay. I've seen her perform and she has some great poetry, some great stuff for us tonight. So uh, welcome, Gabrielle. Thank you, Paul. To Let Them Talk. Great to have you on. And maybe we'll start by telling me a little bit about yourself and telling the, the viewers a little bit about yourself. I know um, you're f just you're from Australia, right? Mm -hmm. To begin with, right? Tell us a little bit about yourself. How you wound up in New York from Australia? Oh yeah. Well, I heard the rumor that a dollar a, a writer made a dollar a word here, so that's what lured me here. But I actually I didn't grow up in Australia. I grew up in Singapore and Dubai. My dad's a pilot, so mm -hmm. I grew up around the world. Around the world, you guys. And New York's the land of gypsies. Dubai, so. huh? Well, so you can, the, I guess events in the Middle East that are happening in the news today must be of some concern to you, what's happening, right? Not too far from your home where your parents live, right? Um, yeah, I try to live in a bubble. I live in a very blessed world of poetry and art, and I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm of Jewish heritage, so I'm completely neutral in a lot of these topics, like mm -hmm. growing up in the Middle East as a Jewish person. It's best to be neutral and not to take a position one way. That's interesting. Well, they're complicated issues. I don't think anything's black or white. There's a lot of gray areas. And mm -hmm. I believe, I guess, more in um, humanity, the good of all, not mm -hmm. one side or the other. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you've been how long in New York City now? Um, I'm coming out to my four-year anniversary in mm -hmm. October. Right, and you're going to school here, or you were going to school? Um, I just graduated from my MFA at the New School. I completed, yeah, a degree in creative writing, fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. though mm -hmm. I'm more known for poetry. When did you discover you wanted to be a poet? Oh, um, I don't know, really. My mother raised me without a television, so we've always had books around the place. No television. No television. Books I still everywhere. don't have one. Of course, you have the, the internet secret? these days. Right. Mm -hmm. So well, I had to do things. Go to the park, make an art piece. Like. Yeah. So <laughs> do you think that television uh, kills the poet in people? Um, I wouldn't make such a claim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's very radical. <laughs> okay, but it doesn't help. Um, I don't know. There's great TV programs being produced these days. I wouldn't completely say TV's uh -huh. the devil. <laughs> uh huh. Great. All right. That's interesting. So, tell us a little bit about wh how do you how does a poet live in America? I mean, how do, can, just, can a poet make a living? Can it be? Can you be a professional poet? Um, well, the poem that I was um, going to read first, actually, um, in the understanding between foxes and light, um, mm -hmm. they paid me ten dollars for this poem. So uh -huh. let me <laughs> see this. This is great. They paid you ten dollars for a poem. Wow! What is this book? The understanding between foxes and light. Yeah, from and great weather for media. Mm -hmm. um, they have some great editors, um, Thomas Folklore, who's also a very talented poet. And Jane Ormond, and um, yeah, mm -hmm. they paid me for it. I almost didn't cash my check until I really needed it for oatmeal and eggs. <laughs> it was very exciting to you be paid to for a poem. You wanted to keep the check, as yeah. A, right? But I don't know if anyone knows how to get paid for poetry. Please let me know. I want to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe songwriting. But uh, so uh, could you? <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, so songwriting. So uh, are you going to read us a poem to begin I would with love already? To. Right yeah. away. Let's start. Let's jump right Yay. in. And here we're going to hear a lot of stories, a lot of poetry from Gabriel. And um, it's in the shape of an eye. So you mm -hmm. can see the text. Okay. Oh, I see. Th this one right here? Yeah. Okay, there you are. And it's... Called Fuck the G-Train. All right. Fuck the G-Train. You are not good in those eyes, so close those eyes and only sit where the other eyes, the ones that eye you like you are magic, see. Mm -hmm. That's a simple one. All mm -hmm. right. Beautiful. I yeah. Okay, and how did how did you get discovered that you were actually printed in, a, in an anthology of poetry like that? Oh, well, I went to um, Thomas is in a second year of the MFA at the New School, and um, we were in a class on collaboration. Which actually, I brought the journal that we produced, um, and they have an open mic on, at Parkside Lounge every mm -hmm. Sunday, and mm -hmm. I try to go to that because that's close by me in the Lower East Side. Sure. Um, yeah. So. And so this is the journal that they that they yeah, and in the class he did a call out and said um, submit to our journal, and then um, mm -hmm. but someone else actually read it and picked it, not Thomas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so tell me more about your philosophy as a, as a poet. I mean, what uh, what what are you looking for in words? I mean, I mean you must love words. I mean, oh, I love words. Um, I think there's a good um, a need for balance between semantics and sound and cadence. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want to compromise one or the other. But mostly, I just really love to be silly. 
I love form. It's good to be restricted. Like I love writing sonnets or like I'm a sestina because sometimes when you have a blank page and you can go anywhere, you kind of end up going nowhere. So mm -hmm. I'd like to be restricted, but then I'll break from the form. I don't mm -hmm. um, always follow through. But you don't limit yourself. I mean, limit. It's not li you don't just do poetry. You do other things as well, prose writing as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, my degree was in fiction. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I write anything. How poetry is more outbursts, I guess. <laughs> What's the secret to fi how do you become a fiction writer? How do you write fiction? How is it done? I've always, because I'm a nonfiction Steal writer. Steal and lie. I'm a news writer, <laughs> right? Yeah. What's that? Steal and lie. <laughs> What's that mean? Tell I me don't more. know. Um, when I first moved to New York, I did an internship with a filmmaker, and she told me all writers are liars and thieves. I don't know if that's true. Um, but um, for me, it's like, I don't know. Um, in narrative fiction, I guess there's more of a need for overall cohesion. In poetry, I don't really feel the need for that so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, what do you have? you have another example for us? You um, yeah, this is from the collaboration class. Um, this is called Untitled or Flying. And this was an interesting thing because I came into this class late. And um, every week you collaborated with a new person in the class, mm -hmm. which is a great way to get to know people. Sure. And this one, a guy in the class, I had sent out an email because I worked as the reading series coordinator mm -hmm. and the chapbook competition coordinator at the new school. And he had read one What's of my a emails. Chapbook? And they have a competition every year for graduates to um, publish a chapbook of their thesis. Uh -huh. And um, a guy in the class remixed um, one of my emails that I had sent out. And he wrote the first stanza. And then um, another girl in the class wrote the second. And then I wrote um, the third. OK. Or actually, no, it went back to front. It doesn't really matter who wrote what. It's collaboration. <laughs> There's right. no like, author. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Um, untitled or flying. Flying is swimming breaststroke through the sky. When I fall asleep, my head trips on worries deep. I travel between them as if I'm moving through fields. Best wishes brightest, a possibility of excitement. It would be grand, this feeling, if only I could scribe it. And that was um, with two very talented poets, Raven Jackson and um, Marcus Bowers, mm -hmm. who are still at the New School doing poetry. Wow. Is the, the new school, is that a common course of study, poetry, and other schools have that? I or? didn't even study poetry. I did fiction and nonfiction, but um, this collaboration class had a lot of poets. I like to keep uh, poets close. Right, They're lovely. Right. <laughs> great, great. So what do you, um, what, what, how do you plan to, um, where are you going to take this, your, your obvious talent and interest in this? Where, oh, where are you going to take it? Where are you going? Um, I don't know. Right now my philosophy is just to keep moving mm -hmm. <laughs> and hopefully uh, find someone to pay me to do what I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Apply for grants. Um, Right, yeah. so yeah, you can become. Now, it, there are, p I mean, you have people who become like poet laureates, right, mm -hmm. of, of countries That's a lot of cities. pressure there. <laughs> right, why is that pressure? Um, well, I've forgotten his name, but the poet laureate in England, um, you know, when it's the king's, well, I, I guess I don't take poetry so seriously. No offense, poets. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> like, he had to write, um, you know, poems for Harry's birthday or on any occasion, and, like, he got criticized in the media, a lot of that. For the style of the poetry, how yeah. good the poetry, if people think it's, mm -hmm. it's sort of like when, uh, when uh, Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon, he said, this is one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Mm -hmm. Womankind, I'd say. They should have <laughs> said that. Right? It was like, it opens up so kind. much criticism, right? Yeah. I mean, you <laughs> dare to say the first words ever spoken on the moon, you know? Uh, right? I don't know. Um, I'll leave it to you. You're the expert. I don't know. Now I'm just thinking poetically about the moon. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. right, 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 right. I've gone off on a tangent in my brain. <laughs> right, good for you. All right, well, can you write a poem like that? If um, I asked you to write a poem, could you do it now? Yeah, we could write a poem together if you wanted to. I've got I'll my try. moleskin and a pen right okay, here. Okay, well, how do we do Actually, it? oh, I've got a guide here for sonnets. So we could start to write a sonnet. And okay. the back of this book, um, which we made in Jackson Taylor's class, he's a wonderful, wonderful teacher and a right. beautiful human being. And um, we wrote sonnets in his class, and then we made a chapbook and we Mm -hmm. um, in the back of the book, which I made with my own two hands, stapling is the hardest part of making <laughs> yeah. a chapbook from okay. like um, getting submissions. To right, right. You call it a zine, one. right? So, how a do you zine? do that? Um, well, you see, a sonnet is made up of 14 lines, 10 syllables per line, iambic pentameter. Uh -huh. And then this isn't um, alliteration, that's not the letter that you begin with. This means A rhymes with A, B rhymes with B, D rhymes with oh, D. Oh, I see. And then you've got the rhyming rhyme. couplet at the end, GG. Okay, right. So, a sonnet <laughs> is made of 14. So, okay, write your own sonnet. A sonnet is made up of 14 lines, 10 syllables per line. There are many different forms. Here are two. Matching letters mean rhyming lines. Um, so should we start it? What's it about? It's about the okay. moon? About the moon. Let's do something so What did you say was line? Um, the uh, first thing ever said on the moon. How many syllables uh, is that? Let's see. Uh, the that's first thing that's ever said that the on the moon. Oh, the <laughs> the, oh, you want to say the, the first the first thing said on the moon? Uh, see the hello that's, everyone. That's <laughs> 
That is one syllable, right? That we need one more. So that's the first thing that was that's, wrote. Yeah, that's we got it. That's ten one, syllables. Two. That's one. That's um, the first Small. Thing. Small is is that one syllable? Yeah, that's one small step. Step. That's one small step for womankind. Yo. Woman, <laughs> woman, kind, right? Yeah, Five, that's six, nine, eight. I think. No? That's one small step for womankind. I guess so. And. <laughs> okay, that's one small step for womankind. And. And. We're, we're writing a sonnet here on like. Okay, now purple. we have to rhyme with moon. We've okay, got good words. Moon. moon and kind are kind of easy to write right, with, right, I think. Right. Loon, um, tune. Loon, uh, tune, right. As one, uh, and uh, let's play I a like tune. to pick the last word first and then okay. like walk towards it. Okay, <laughs> all right. So <laughs> the last word would be like tune, right? Do you want to go tune? Oh, let's write a tune. tune. I want to get paid as a poet, so I should write a tune. That's a good one. Oh. I want to get paid as a poet. Tune, no. Okay. Get paid as a poet writing tunes. Okay. Or writing a tune. Writing a tune. There you go. Okay, so we're writing a sonnet here. Sonnet is, as we described earlier, 14 lines, 10 syllables per line, and uh, they have to rhyme in a certain format that we have here in this chapbook yeah, that allows you to Yeah, this is um, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, right, F, right. E, F. So what have we written so far? That's um, the first thing ever said on the moon, that's one small step for womankind. Get paid as a poet writing a tune. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> that, we don't have to do the whole thing, yeah, but that's, no, a, we'll that's a good tomato. example right there. That's interesting that's how to write a I sonnet. I love writing sonnets. <laughs> All right, sonnets. And so Shakespeare, of course, was a sonnet writer. Mm -hmm. He wrote many sonnets in that yeah. same sort of format. Yeah. Yep. Everyone. Yeah, that's a Shakespearean uh, okay. sonnet. Shakespearean sonnet. Interesting. I wow. By the way, we are live and we have our phone number, which is uh, on the screen 212 757 1541. Our guest, Gabriel Don, is a poet from the East Village who uh, is a recent MFA graduate from uh, the New School and is uh, involved in uh, promoting open mics and other poetry events and is also a prose writer, a fiction writer as well. And you were going to. Write some of your prose for us. Read yeah, some of yeah, our prose I would for love us. To. And Thank we're going to move on to reading some prose now. And uh, and I think this is great because this is a great lesson on on for writers for budding writers out there how to do this, how to get into this. What are we gonna? What do you have here for us? Um, this I when I read, I like to read. I learned this from John Irving actually at a Columbia University reading. Um, he always reads what he's still working on and what he's editing, and um, you edit as you go because I like to test it out. So this is called Reluctant Relationship. It's a short story I'm currently in, but it's ending up not being so short. It just keeps going, which is mm -hmm. kind of good. An accidental novel, hopefully. Sure. Um, but it's about a girl who, um, she thinks she's ill, but she's she's a bit of a hypochondriac. Mm -hmm. um, she thinks she's ill and going crazy, but she's just fallen in love and lost, and she's in a relationship, and she goes to a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of flashes back through her life. But okay. um, the excerpt I'm going to read is her um, talking to Dr. Smith, okay. who's her psychiatrist. Go right ahead. Mr. Smith, in all due respect, this is serious. Please don't smile. A smile that sneered, little girl, you got the blues sarcastically. As if I'd never paid taxes or lost a parking spot. As if I'd never stripped being a sugar baby to pay for my tertiary education. As if creepy fetishists had never touched Cassie on my feet for $400 an hour. Unnerving massages navigating the nooks of our dainty toes. As if we'd never kept a roof over our own heads. As if warring wasn't for women. I had worked all the days of my life. Every day I worked in the unpaid, unappreciated position titled woman. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. And so that's part of a much longer work that you're working oh, on. Oh, yeah. Usually I like to finish a short story at 7,000 words. Mm -hmm. um, I like, yeah, to see where and the end's going. But this is like, I'm on 20 pages now. What is now. this about? What, what, is the in, what is this whole, the whole thrust of the, of the story you're working on you just read a part of now? What, what um, well, about? that's, one of the thrusts was the psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, um, there's a lot of thrusts, I guess. I'm a, a big digressor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's, um, well, it goes back in time and... It's also about her relationship with Cassandra. It's about her relationship with Harry, the guy she's in love with, and it's about her relationship with um, her mother, with um, Cassie, her best friend from high school. And I couldn't ignore, well, her name's Cassandra, and I couldn't ignore the mythology there. Mm -hmm. And um, the myth of Cassandra is she um, spits in a, um, a mouth of someone, I think, and then she gets cursed to um, always see the future but have no one believe her. 
So that's kind of what happens to her friend a little bit. But I'm like, what would be equally as transgressive in society now or in high school in their situation? Um, and what happens to Cassandra is she doesn't spit in someone's mouth. She, um, rumors about her spread about um, female ejaculation. Oh, I see. So okay. Obviously, that's how it goes. <laughs> wow. That's, <laughs> that's a, what my What a lead from this. <laughs> now I know the true story behind Cassandra. Okay, that's the yeah. whole story. Okay, very, very good. All right, great. So... <coughs> W tell me some of the things that, that motivate, that give you your, uh, your ideas, that give you your motivations. W what are some of the things that around you, around in life, that, that, that motivate you the most to write? Um, it depends what space I'm in. Um, in my office, at my studio where I work mostly, um, I found a lot of the women in my life in New York, older poets or more established poets, um, the space you create. So I have like, you know, an inspiration wall and where things from my life find their way there. And as we're talking about before, you know, I have mm -hmm. Ganesh. I'm like multiple, like spiritual um, things. A lot of unicorns, so many unicorns, mermaids, fairies, a Buddha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then I guess just living, you know, and I'm an empiricist. I don't read the news. We were debating this earlier. Right. I don't read the news. I like to see things with my own two eyes. And I think with fiction, it's kind of like, have you seen those um, things that you spin? Yeah. And on one side, there's a cage. And on one side, there's a bird or wings and a human. And when you spin it, the bird's in the cage or it turns into an angel. Um, I don't think you can make up something you haven't seen. It's always the words you use to describe it. Uh, you're just merging things. Mm -hmm. So it's important for you to have experience, to oh actually yes, see things, yes. to go to a place. Yes. Are you an adventurous type Have your type heart person? broken. I think, yeah. <laughs> there you go, right, emotionally yeah. Yeah. as well, or to go to places. And travel. Yeah, my father's a pilot, so traveling's been a big part of my life. Wow, where, where I've been so to over 40 countries. You've been to over 40 yeah, countries? Yeah, I travel for free uh -huh. and standby. Oh, you're so lucky, man. Stand <laughs> and then by. I find couches around the world or friends, or I've worked in a hostel cleaning toilets. So. Co coach? Couch surfing. Couch surfing. Yeah. What are some of the places you've been? I know you told me some of them. You've been to China. I have been to China. Yeah. You actually saw Mao Zedong. Yeah. You saw Mao Zedong in the gray in his mm -hmm. glass, and melting. you said he looked like he's melting. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's interesting. Not too many people that I, that I know have seen that. Um, have what are some other London. interesting places you've been? Um, oh. and you mentioned Amsterdam. Yeah, I love Amsterdam. Um, places I've been. I love How Brazil. That's really fascinating. Um, art scene happening there right now. Mm -hmm. um, now, of all these different places, you've gone 40 countries, which is the one with the most vitality, most excitement, most interesting? The LES, for sure. LES, Lower East Side <laughs> of Manhattan, yeah. right? So of the whole world, you've chosen <laughs> yep. any place you could go, uh -huh. the Lower East Side. For sure. All right, that's mm -hmm. What is it about the Lower East Side, about New York City that's attracted you? Um, I guess, well, the, it's, it's the land of gypsies. There's so many different people, meaning that it's the melting pot, as they like to say. I should find a fresh phase since I'm a poet, but... The diversity. Mm -hmm. And convenience, mm -hmm. you know? I can walk home at any time of night. I can get chicken mm -hmm. wings at any time of night. And <laughs> safety. <laughs> Three dollar beers. Relative safety, <laughs> right? And it's Crazy a, artists. If you can cool make people. the rent here, it's not an expensive place to live, what, mm -hmm. but the rent yeah. is the killer yeah, thing. Yeah, the rent, yeah, That's where they sure. kill you on the rent, right? All right, great. And do you have a website or any... Um, I own my domain, GabrielleDon.com, but I haven't put my website up yet. It's oh. very confusing for me because I do so many things. I'm a photographer, right. an actor, I make films, um, I write, and I've got to figure out how I'm going to launch it. I just graduated, so I'm finally coming out of my thesis right. haze. Right. Now you <laughs> work, uh, I, work, I saw you at the park side, and you were with a group. Tell me a little bit about this group that you work with, that you put on these events with. Oh, I don't put on those events. Uh -huh. That's the Great Weather for Media, who published me in the uh -huh. Understanding Between Foxes and Light. They right. put that on on Sunday. Well, yeah. Who does again? What's, what's That's Great Weather for Media. Great but I run, a, I run a couple of series around the city. Mm -hmm. I do Pies and Scribes, which is where actors and writers come together, and you can read your own work. Actually, David Peel's performed at that. Okay. It used to be at the Tuck Shop on St. Mark's, right. which And I down. saw you sing with the David Peel band. I mean, that's yeah, where I first I'm saw the, you. I am the Lower East Side. Yes. David Peel and the Lower East Side. Da you're the Lower East Side, right, <laughs> um. David? And you're a singer. With, for folks who might not know that, I guess we waited 18 minutes into the show to mention it, but uh, Gabrielle has, is a singer with... David Peel's band, mm -hmm. and uh, it's so well known. If you live in the village, you know David Peel. Everybody knows David Peel lives in the village, and David Peel has been on the show as well. Not, oh, have not you? Recently. Fantastic! I've got to look at him. He told it. a story about uh, him being d mistaken for. Um, John Lennon. Oh, wonderful. Oh, yeah, he does like to tell that story. Anton Perrick, actually, a really dear friend of mine, recently gave me a CD to pass on to David, which was footage of him speaking at the Chelsea Hotel ranting about, um, I've forgotten what the crisis was. It was something going on in politics at the time in the 60s or 70s, but at it was just, Chelsea? like, fantastic. That man yeah. can just, like, whew, I love right. it. How did, you meet, how did you end up singing with, the, uh, with uh, David Peel and the Lower East Side? How did I end up singing with David Peel? Oh, well, I met him, first of all, briefly at a space that my friend Lee Wells and Katie Payton run in, um, on Fifth Street between Bowery and Second. Yeah, Bowery's mm -hmm. Third, right? 
um, and he was there performing, so I kind of saw him there. We didn't really meet, but then I hosted, um, you know, Chris Flash. Mm -hmm. I, I'm the MC for the festival every year in Tompkins Square Park, the commemoration of the riots. Sure. And David Peel was there, and I went up. I'm like, hi, can I be your backup singer? Because they totally seemed loose about what they were doing on stage. They had yeah. no set plan, and they were flexible. So I'm like, and can I be your backup singer? He was like, yes. And then he was like, we hung so out. So now after you're that. a regular, now you're a regular contributor. <laughs> great. So you already are a singer. You made it into mm -hmm. the, the. I am gig. a singer. Uh, David Peel, one of the great uh, off-the-cuff poets I've ever met. He is so fantastic. He right? makes up poetry like it's On going out of style. I love I mean, when he comes to my poetry yeah. readings. He just never stops. Right? No, he doesn't. He's a freestyler. He's a freestyle poet, David Peel. We'll have to have him on sometime in the yeah. future. Right, do you have anything else you want to share with us? Because I just love your work, and I'd love yes. you to, find, to give um, us some more well to share with us. This is um, a, a magazine, um, a literary journal that my friend Joseph A.W. Quintilla publishes called Short, Fast, and Deadly. Mm -hmm. um, he he like, thinks yeah. that, what's his saying? In the future, everything will be like under one sentence, three words. Uh -huh. um, but he, I met him at the Poetry Festival just a bit over a year ago on Governor's Island. And... Um, he asked me to submit something to the, his literary journal, and he likes appropriation poems, which is when you use other text to make um, mm -hmm. a new text. Sure. And I, the next day, I was sitting at a Mexican restaurant. Um, do you know Benny's? On uh, yes. is it six and eight? Right, of course. And having three little margaritas, and then I wrote a poem using the. Um, oh, margaritas are great. Using for the menu. Right. Where am I at? Is there, is there the, you know many poets seem to. Have have alcohol problems. Is there a connection between alcohol and good poetry? No, absolutely just, not. No. Yeah. I can write in all states. Right. <laughs> so it's just coincidental. Oh, whoa. I just discovered a secret message he wrote here for me. It says, on the edge of everything to Gabrielle Don. Thank you, oh, that's Joseph. Nice. <laughs> okay, let me find my poem. Sorry. I thought I followed the page earlier. Did I? Sorry. That's right. You can talk to me while I do yeah, this. Yeah, that's right. This is Let Them Talk. Gabriel Don is finding one of her poems to read to us. And, uh, I'm the only person in the world that, well, with uh, my family who keep my last name, yeah. who can find themselves in a Mexican menu. Since my last name's Don, D-O-N, I could use the tequila menu. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Very well. And, and your name comes from the Russian the river Don in Russia, mm -hmm. right? And I suppose that's the mythology. And your dad's side of the family is... Uh, I could have just used the contents page, but now right. I've committed to this. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> And, uh, and she has, is a published poet. Her poetry is in many publications. We have at our feet, right, many right here. And we've been going through them and, uh, and reading some of her work, both prose and poetry, and talking about the groups that she works with. Um, uh, Gabrielle is a... I also uh, host um, a salon in a community garden in East Village. You should come to that. It's right around the corner from where you, um, uh, you're at. I'm on 13th Street between A and B at Diaz y Flores. I do like a salon thing. And that one is actually compulsory participation. You're not allowed to come unless you do something or share oh. something. Okay, you have to share something. I want everyone to be vulnerable and I don't want it to be like a frat party right. or a freak show. Oh, uh, you don't but have to we have a barbecue. I'm we drink quick to share mm -hmm. things. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Most <laughs> people know me. Things. Okay, There's I found it. All right, great. Here we are. Okay, Gabrielle so this is written complete with um, completely with words excerpted from the menu at Benny Burritos. Okay. And it's called... Wait, say that again? I'm sorry, I missed Benny Burritos, All completely right, right. with words um, okay. appropriated from Benny Burritos' Mexican okay. menu. All right, there we go. It's called Two Sides. Okay, go for it. Blanco that's been kept in white oak casks, called Don, imported domestic honey, Patron, 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 Silver top Dolores, shredded sweet black, grilled inside out, lightly served on the side, super on the side, rolled in a choice deep in. So you can make poetry out of a menu? Mm -hmm. I can make there poetry out of anything. Yeah. You can do it too. Right. Well, you're, you, have a, you seem to have a talent for it. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, that's good. And, um, okay, great. So. Uh, we have about five minutes left. I'd like mm -hmm. to hear some more of your material if you. Okay. While we um, have these last few minutes. What should I read? I know I'm going to make you. Uh, um, well, I guess because you read you're everything. This kind of merges me um, yeah. interview and writing because yes. this I wrote for Jackson Taylor um, class. He was so great. I took him right. um, twice, mm -hmm. and. Um, Another person in the class put mm -hmm. together this book, I Remembers. Okay. Uh, I think using the printing machine at McNally's. Uh -huh. He didn't have to staple. <laughs> but, um, it seems I like part, remember part, is part of being a poet is being a producer and producing the, the actual books that you're uh, publishing them, right? Yeah. Or right. there's, um, you know, online now, so you don't have to use paper. But I yeah. do like, even though I love trees, I feel conflicted. I like seeing my poetry in print. I know. There's <laughs> something about that, isn't there? Yeah. Um, but I remember Joe Brainerd, um, a wonderful artist and poet. He did this whole um series of I remember and we wrote them in class Jackson always made us write in class mm -hmm. and that was like at eight o'clock at night and I thought I'm only a morning writer but he taught me I could write in the evening too mm -hmm. um so I'll read a bit of it yes 
I remember being told I left a trail of olive pits like Hansel and Gretel crumbs as a toddler trapezing around the house. My parents would follow the path of pits through hallways and doorways to find me grubby handed. I remember the first time I felt depressed. I was 16 in Singapore and a glass wall appeared between me and the world. I remember the first time I floated away. I had to hold onto the street post, tie a knot around the pole to keep my sanity from ballooning away from the sidewalk. I remember you, though I try to forget. I remember lying on a beach towel over hot tiling in my parents' backyard in Dubai with a flu-stuffed nose, the smell of sweat, writing adolescent poetry. I remember feeling safe, my parents invincible and immortal. I remember your touch. I remember trying. I remember unicorns in Amsterdam, goldfish in toilets, minstrels in the kitchen. You didn't let me get my own bike. I learned like a local to side saddle riding on the back of your bike. My hands hidden under your shirt, defrosting against the warmth of your stomach. You always kissed me before you left a room. You always said my name. I remember the day my grandfather died. I came home from school and everyone was quiet. My grandma took me upstairs and ran me a bath. I remember standing behind bleary-eyed partiers, hungry post-night out among bucklivers stacked high, honey-glazed pistachio pastries, dough folded into triangles stuffed with sour spinach, deep-fried gulab jamon soaked in syrup, pretzel-shaped bright orange jalabi, mahaba and halva, ordering Lebanese pizza at 4 a.m. with cheese, zata, meat, egg, mint, chili, labna, and tomato. I remember the beach water and trees, the smell of eucalyptus and jasmine, marshes green, lush swamps and rivers following their winding course, bending and curving, dividing and connecting, rainbow lorikeets shaking trees at sunset, a vibrational racket, kookaburras sounding in gum trees, I'm not very good at that noise, <laughs> my father's better, do you want me to stop? You no, could you? We have a half a minute, oh, okay. Um, cut me off whenever you're ready. The song my grandma had for the colors of the rainbow she sang as we walked past a waterfall on the hill. I remember when Singapore didn't have McDonald's. The day it opened, I ate a fillet of fish and we moved to Dubai and Dubai didn't have a McDonald's. The tallest building then was the Trade Center and we could see it from everywhere. We needed a four wheel drive to get anywhere over sandy mounds, incomplete roads, undeveloped landscape clear blue water, a horizon. Thank you so much, Gabrielle Don, for joining us on Let Them Talk. Thank you so much. All right, much. take care. All right, thank you very much. We'll see you next week.